That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Yes, it was an epic time on the moon and here at 3rd in Detroit, where a cohort of nobles began their journey together. The Murphy class of 72 excelled in the classroom and in sports, and perhaps more importantly, brought into adulthood a commitment to noble deeds, even if coming of age did not always feel so noble. I wouldn't take back anything that happened to me in my journey, because I think it prepared me for some of the challenges and things to persevere through in life that we had to go through. Not every day is pleasant, not every day is wonderful, but to me it was just a really great experience going there. The education was great, the teachers for the most part were good. Well, no need for the necktie anymore. The building's still here, now serving another institution, but Daniel Murphy High is no more. It closed property sold years ago amid challenges for the school and archdiocese, and yet, The legacy of the class of Noble 72 lives on, shaped by experiences we cherished and in some cases simply endured. Let's share some memories. It was awesome to to be in that environment for for those four years. And um, it, it, it formed my philosophy and the way I look at things in, in this world today. So for that, I am eternally grateful. I think the camaraderie that we didn't knew, know then, because of all, some of, there was some stuff going on at the, at the school, but I think right now we've learned from it. We've all moved forward in life and we can sit and talk and laugh about it. The one thing that just stands out starkly for me is the diversity that we had in our class, in our school, uh, especially in the 60s in Los Angeles. Um, The school was situated such that uh, kids from all over the city, uh, all types of backgrounds, uh, found themselves there for four years. (laughs) And uh, we were together for four years, and I have to say, um, nothing in my life since then replicated that experience for me. Navigating my way through uh, Murphy was an exercise in um, getting through in spite of Murphy, not necessarily because of it. I'm Kyle Irvine, class of 72, nobles. It'll be fun to see everybody. Hi, everybody. Mike Russell here. I'm going to answer a couple questions, get you up to date after it's only been 50 years. Well, hello, everybody. In case you don't recognize me, I'm Frank Michaels. And uh, yes, it's been 50 years and it probably shows on my face. Greetings, class of 72. Stanley King here. Hi, I'm Paul Hill, class of 72. I'm glad we all made it. Greetings, fellow class of 72 nobles. It's Bob Hackle. Michael Murphy, class of 72. Go nobles. Let me say good day. I'm Dr. Thomas Parham, current president of California State University, Dominguez Hills. Class of 72, Bob Piste, Daniel Murphy nobles. Can't wait to see everybody that shows up. And uh, it's been way too long. My name is Keith Douglas Collins. I'm a member of the class of 72, and I was the original member of the class of 68 there also. And uh, where do we start? Class of 72, this is Michael Stevenson with no tie. This is Ulrich Jerome Patillo Jr. speaking to you. And I'm thankful and grateful to be with you tonight on this historic occasion. I'm also thankful to my Lord and Savior Jesus for being able to be here. Hi, this is the former Father Michael McKeon, class of 1972, Daniel Murphy High School. I want to thank you all for coming to dinner tonight, and I want to encourage you all to swap stories 
and avoid Patrick Healy because he'll record all this stuff and put it on the internet. The four years that we were in high school, so much took place. We lost Bobby Kennedy, Martin Luther King. You had the Chicago Democratic Convention. You had the, the Summer Olympics with the Smith and Carlos protests. And then in November of 68, Tricky Dick got elected. Well, I'm sorry, Richard Nixon got elected. So that's just a little bit of history. And I always think that we were put at Daniel Murphy for a reason. Best Murphy memory. Wow. Well, obviously the football team is where I forged most of my, uh, the best relationships, the deepest relationships and where I had the most fun. Um, it was amazing. I will say this though, going to Murphy and the diversity of the enrollment, um, was worked out wonderfully in my life. Um, it was awesome to, to be in that em environment for, uh, for those four years. Really enjoyed being playing freshman football. That was my first experience. I started that in the summer, being able to make friends and work together. And we had a championship team and we came back and we won every game, but one and the only game we didn't win, we tied. And then we, we had the honor of having OJ Simpson hand us our certificates for freshman football. Best Murphy memory has to be Coach Porter's amazing basketball team winning the divisional title senior year. That battle royal at the sports arena against a much bigger school was a fantastic and inspirational moment, one we all took enormous pride in. Just glad to be able to make it from year to year and uh, not get too much uh, uh, attention from Father Kiefer and, uh, and, and Father Lopez. And how so. many detentions did you rack up? Oh, God. Uh, well, I still have a hard time sitting down. <laughs> One day, a spontaneous food fight erupted. I don't know who started it. I don't know who ended it. And it was brief. But what I remember is a tomato being let loose. I think it was a big girl tomato. And it was ripe. I know that for what happened later. And it sailed up and over. I think it was destined for somebody, but I'm not sure who. It sailed up and over, over the, the pathway and right into the wall of, of uh, Father Kiefer's office. It hit the wall there, exploded, and dripped on down. Uh, in some ways, that might have been my most satisfying moment at Murphy, watching that tomato drip on down. After the game, we're second down beers, a bunch of us. I had Alan Apone, Small Dino, bunch, bunch of guys. And uh, the Torrance police come up, look at us and go, what are you guys doing? Well, we're just celebrating our victory at wherever we were. And uh, they, uh, they looked at the back and say, you guys uh, over 21? So, oh, well, maybe not. But they just made us pour the beer out down the drain and uh, let us go. This photo was supposed to go to Father Kiefer, and I can share the story now. Kyle had gotten O.J. Simpson's autograph, still decades, of course, before his fall from grace, and was not about to let that go. When I went to school on Monday, um, I gave Father Kiefer his program, and I'm thinking he's not going to know that I had carefully, carefully tore the picture out. <laughs> I had gotten his autograph. Later on that day, during <laughs> Father Kiefer called me over there. You know, he did this, his little finger. Uh -huh. And uh, he said, Mr. Irvine. I am missing a page in my program. <laughs> but did Father Kiefer ever get to see that no, picture? Or not? No, he didn't. Patrick, no. <laughs> <laughs> no one saw that photo for a long time.
Father Henry Kinkins was quite intimidating. For one thing, he wore a black robe and all the other priests wore white. I'm not sure what that meant, but there's something different about him. He had a thick accent. He liked to use the words bamboozle, a big deal. He had this Dutch accent and it was quite um, intimidating. He would occasionally call students to task for speaking out of hand. His personality certainly came through, especially for the parent-teacher conference. All right, channel Father Hinkins for us. Okay. Um, Mrs. Bastet, your son is a creep. <laughs> <laughs> and as a result of this, words like sarcophagus stuck in my mind and it developed in me, or I felt a developing interest later in life in the classics. So I've read some of those books, I still do. Homer and the Iliad, Sophocles, all because of Heinrich Higgins. Favorite teacher, tough one. I thought most of the staff were pretty cool. Uh, I liked science and Dave Oliver made chemistry quite entertaining. The chem and bio labs were definitely a hoot. Mr. Oliver he yeah. used to pop his knees back all the time. Really kind of weird. And I remember him teaching us that if we're going to drink, it should be vodka because that was the purest. <laughs> Another teacher that did me a big favor was uh, Mr. Rock, who was the English teacher. In my freshman year, he told me I was the worst speller he had ever met. So I made a concerted effort to learn to spell or at least recognize when words were wrong. And that helped me a lot later on. My favorite teacher was Mr. Tony Zane. May he rest in peace. My favorite subject was math. So uh, I always received excellent grades in math and Mr. Zane was an excellent teacher. So he's number one. Bill Goodwin, he inspired me to study history. That was the, the, the one class that I succeeded in without really having to worry too much about succeeding. And for whatever reason, my brain could tell the story of an historical situation. And I could learn, and I learned how to write through that class. And he was very prim and proper in his dress. If you remember, he was always, yeah. his tie was always pulled up to the neck and he was always well coiffed. I like Mr. Goodwin. He was my favorite teacher too, simply because of his teaching style. He really inspired people to learn. He inspired. There were other teachers that didn't, they were there and they had their style, but I liked him the best. Leroy Porter got nothing but mad love for him and even as he now dwells among the ancestors in heaven as he's passed on. Mr. Porter was, was great because he was relatable. He was great because he was a role model in the class for those of us that had no black instructors. He was an intellect because he was bilingual. So Leroy Porter taught Spanish. And I learned a lot of Spanish in his class because he told, taught us how to talk to the young ladies. He gave us some nice slangy things to say and how to be romantic and nice and fun. He was a good man. And my God, he could really play basketball. Mr. Leroy Porter taught me how to dress, taught me how to act, taught me the definition of what cool was. Uh, I love that man. I think he was my first mentor. I didn't know it then, but I know it now. So he's definitely my favorite teacher. He was also very authentic. And the authenticity of a Leroy Porter was, was framed not just in the keeping it real language that he would use, but in the life conversations that he would have with each of us. And lots of us don't make it through just psychologically without Leroy Porter. Because we would spend our lunch times in his classroom where he would just teach life lessons. Whether it was about relationships, whether it was about home life, whether it was about discipline in your studies, whether it was about what you'll look forward to in the future, he was that, that, that conscious manhood that taught us a lot about how to be a socially conscious, respectable young black man navigating your way through these pathways to productivity and success. There were you know, other folk who were very connected to us, but there were some other folk whose, I think, behavior was just scandalous and hostile. Can you put your finger on one thing that really stuck in your craw about Murphy? Probably the, the implicit, sometimes explicit hostility that instructors would have 
that really assaulted your dignity and humanity as just a human being. I mean, I, I can't imagine being in biology class and you had people like Brother Mark. He'd be yelling at folks, stand up, clown. You know, that, just that kind of, you know, that hostility kind of stuff. It's like, that's not a very nurturing, supportive environment for young men to be able to go through. And that's why I say getting through Murphy, we got in through it in spite of it, not because of it. Because there were so many ways in which there were examples of folk trying to keep people down. Brother Mark met with me and he said, you should go get a job at the city driving a trash truck. O'Leary was an incredibly judgmental person. Very, very judgmental. One thing that got under my skin was maybe, oh, some of the student-teacher relationships maybe, you know, bothered me a little bit, but that's just the way it was. Father Cavalli was walking by, and he looked in, and he saw, he saw me monkeying around with the chairs, at least what he thought. He walked in. He did his finger, he pulled me up, come on up in front of the class, bend over, he said. He pulled out the four inch belt and he started uh, the punishment. It was one swat and it hurt. The second swat and that really hurt. And then he said, tell me you've had enough, but he'd already given me the third swat and I said, enough. And I hobbled back to my little desk. I did not get, I never got swatted. Don't know what you've been missing, do you? What I hated most was the corporal punishment while Father Cavalli was principal, dead wrong, and I still can't believe such a thing was tolerated. How were you humiliated? Oh, God, I... Oatmeal and a tomato down my underwear. <laughs> um, of course, I returned it when, when we had our, our hazing... One of the guys was in a trash can for about two hours. And I had to go ask my mother for a dress to take the school to wear. Yeah. <laughs> and my heels. I was like, how am I going to hide this from my father, right? And so, but I did. I put it in a bag and we got on the bus and got off. But that was the worst experience for me. I, didn't, I hated that. And I had to make a choice. It was either, did I hate initiation or did I hate hell week in football? Two, two and three day practices for 10 days. Oh, anyway, freshman initiation was worse than I'll take hell week over freshman initiation anytime. Yeah. <laughs> but, and what I did as a senior, I didn't make my uh, freshman dress up. I just, all he had to do was buy lunch and carry my books to class. And that was it. Yeah. He had it real easy. Semper Ubi, Sub Ubi which literally translates always wear underwear. It was something I got forced into, and then I played that part for the next four, four years. I think I said this to Kyle one time when we <laughs> yeah. first started, was that we were all forced into play some role, and I played the role of the staunch defender of what would now be Tucker Carlson's views of the world. <laughs> So, and I never really had those books, so that's, you know, that's the odd part about it. You guys have all seen this. If you took Tony Zane's math class, Monday morning, I don't know how he did this, and I asked him later on, and he had the sports page straight up, and he was down like this. Yeah. He, he had, and he had, the, he had the class assignment written on the board. And it's, he also said, do not disturb, do not bother me. The ties, I hate that tie so much that I don't wear them anymore. Uh, another thing was we couldn't have the mustache. And I've been growing this mustache since June 1st, 1972.
summer school class was an eye opener. We were just introducing ourselves, talking about family life, things like that. And two of the guys said that they had never seen anybody black in person. We wanted to have a black student union. And Father Lopez, wouldn't, somebody wouldn't let us have it. So he said, you can have a black awareness club, okay? So we were like, okay, cool. Then the yearbook comes out, and, and everybody else got their name on the thing. All you guys are a bunch of brothers standing around with no name. That really bugged me. They forgot, oh, we forgot to put the name, put your name on. That bugged me. Now, you're laughing about it now, but yeah. it did kind of bother you at the time. I think it bothered me a lot at the time, you know. I, I understand how people think. I understand uh, power plays. We were, not, we, were not, we were not powerful on campus. We did get the picture, though. But there's no name. Dr. Parham and the late Dr. Aldrich Patterson were close. Both also attended UC Irvine and became psychologists. Dr. Parham recalled his outrage on learning that in a supposed letter of recommendation, a Murphy faculty member, now also deceased, wrote he did not think Patterson was college material. He became a big famous psychologist. Got hired then by Cal State University Chico and spent 30 years of his career there before he retired and did fabulous work doing lots of wonderful contributions, scholarship, clinical work, whatever, and the amount of lives he touched and people he saved, right? And somehow they didn't think he was college material. That's the essence of what gut bucket racism looks like, even for, you know, for Black students at Murphy. That's what our experience was like. When Keith Collins graduated, the Calarogan had no information available, but the world soon did. I had an aunt that made rugs from carpet scraps, and she taught me how to make these, make these rugs and carpets, man. And the thing, the first year was kind of tough. Uh, I sold all my belongings to buy these carpet scraps. All my friends, including Kyle, were kept telling me I was a laughing stock of the neighborhood. And this thing took off. And I've been making custom rugs and tapestries 50 years, travel all over the, all over the world, my work's in museums, I got some serious collectors, and so I've been doing that. I, I have five children, I got four daughters. My oldest daughter recently graduated from Yale, got her PhD, I'm too impressed. Uh, my other children are doing well too. I got one that's managing the, the Fairmont uh, Miramar Hotel in Santa Monica. I got another one that was in Lion King. My youngest daughter was, was Nala and started Disney's Lion King traveling show. Um, another one was Dance with Debbie Allen. My son works with me. He tells me all the things I don't know. So I'm very blessed to have him. So I've been doing that, man. Bob Hackle aspired to international auto racing and indeed has raced successfully both here and in Europe, but ultimately showbiz won out. After 45 years in the TV and film industry, I'm retired and living in Sherman Oaks with my lovely wife, Yvonne. We have an autistic son, Lloyd, age 30, who's an accomplished visual effects artist, and a daughter, Romy, who recently graduated from Occidental College. After Murphy, I graduated from LMU, was a staff exec at CBS, HBO, and Disney. Uh, I was a production manager, music producer, visual effects producer, and a member of the Motion Picture Editor's Guild. I'm credited on 70 feature movies, some of them winning Academy Awards and Golden Globes. In 2011, Yvonne and I helped launch Exceptional Minds, a nonprofit organization that trains autistic young adults for careers in digital arts and animation. Paul Hill left no doubt where he was headed, law enforcement. I became a police officer and spent the next almost 35 years in law enforcement. I worked uh, patrol traffic, at which time I managed to stop one of our Class of 72 alumni who re will remain nameless, but I didn't write him a ticket. And at one time I skated for the Los Angeles Thunderbird roller derby team until the league finally collapsed and went under. I've lived in the South Bay area for about 40 plus years. I have two daughters and I enjoy doing lots of things with them. I'm a, a life member of the Magic Castle uh, and I also enjoy bowling. I'm learning how to golf and I've just taken up ballroom dancing if you can believe it. 
Kyle Irvine remembered rapping with the man while expressing the ideas of a greater need to revolutionize the traditions and declared business his ambition. When I got out of high school and went over to UCLA for two years, um, a revelation occurred, so to speak, the light bulb went on and that changed my life, um, which was, uh, and I'm glad it did because I had a chip on my shoulder when I was in high school, but that chip got knocked off two years out of high school. And, and it was for the better. As we zoomed into the room came Kyle's fondest but, treasure from high school. Oh, here, That's here when he and Yolanda Hello. met. Hi, everyone. How are you? Good. <laughs> and and you great. still married him? Well, I think I changed him. <laughs> she was supposed to be Joe Wheatley at this dance. And Joe Wheatley happened to be sick that day. Didn't come to school. And a good friend of mutual friend introduced my wife and I. When I told her I was going to marry her, she thought I was crazy. Who is this little guy telling me that we're going to get married? Well, 44 years of marriage and 59 years later, we're still together. See you soon. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Work is a means to an end. So, yes, you retire, you get all the benefits and all that, but the, the best Part of my life is coaching outside of marriage, raising my two daughters and having two grandchildren. And I was, I've been fortunate to have coached my two younger brothers, my two daughters, and a host of other uh, youngsters. Stanley King's post-Murphy path to electrical engineering and beyond took him first to the University of Santa Clara for multiple degrees. I started my career as a computer and chip design engineer and later moved into telecommunications. I transitioned to engineering manager and then into technical support and customer service. In retirement, I travel widely with Patricia, my partner. We love camping and visiting national parks. I also began taking solo bike support, self-supported bicycle trips, which I really enjoyed. I tutor high school and college students part-time, and I took up the guitar to enjoy learning and playing music. Mike McKeon wrote of becoming a criminal attorney but chose a different path after beginning college in SoCal. The Dominicans, both the men and women, were very, very influential in my life. Went off to St. Albert's College in seminary in 1976, was ordained a priest in 1981 and two, deacon in 81, priest in 82, was stationed in Alaska for my first year in 1979. And I spent the majority of my time from 79 to 94, either living in Alaska or dream of living in Alaska. It's a place I go to on a regular basis to resolve many things in my own life. I left and took a leave of absence in 86. I got dismissed from the Dominicans back in 89 when I wouldn't go to, the, to a mental institution for them. And, then, um, and that's not an exaggeration. That's what they wanted me to do. I got married in 1992, and uh, that was probably the best thing that I've ever done. Not the marriage per se, but fathering two sons. They are the light of my life, and they are strong young men with definite opinions about um, their world and the world they live in and the world that I would like them to live in. And that's where we are now. I'm retired. Oh, my goodness. That's a fascinating life. I had no idea you would... Had done it's not that things. fascinating. It's just I made a lot of mistakes. That's why. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Frank Michaels aspired to live in the country, but on his way to becoming a celebrated vintner, accepted a widely sought invitation to make his first stop in Palo Alto. I went on to uh, attend Stanford. I lived in Germany. I lived in Japan. And I've lived out most of my life uh, up in the Northwest in Seattle. I have a wife in and two daughters and, and two grandsons uh, up here. Um, and it's just been a wonderful life. Eventual attorney Michael Murphy did not name an ambition. He was already too busy working. I started my working career because I wanted a car. And so I stopped playing football. And I ended up starting working. And I worked at Bob's Big Boy in Toluca Lake. And ultimately worked my way up to cook. As soon as I was done with school, I was off and running. 
So I never got detention because I always said, hey, I got to go manage that cafeteria. <laughs> And I joined Rotary International, which I really enjoyed. And I became involved in the Chambers of Commerce and, and helped set up a lot of nonprofits and became involved with those and community activities. Thomas Parham declared his commitment to help others in the best way I can and credits a mentor for helping him on a path that included becoming a psychologist, UC Irvine Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, and for the past four years, President of Cal State University, Dominguez Hills. And Joe White is the one who really transformed my life and really crystallized my choices about how to operationalize my desire to be a helping professional in the context of a career being a psychologist. And now it's pretty clear at this point that not only am I a psychologist, but I try very much to be a healer. And I try to be a healing presence in the lives of other people. And whether I'm talking to crowns that are as big as 10 or as big as 10,000 in arenas, which I've addressed, whether I'm teaching a class to my students, whether I'm writing my scholarship, you know, in these professional journals or writing books or sending it out to the newspaper or consulting to corporations, I'm always trying to be a healing presence in the lives of the people I touch. And in that way, I'm fulfilling that legacy that I wrote about in the Keller Rogan that said, trying to help other people in the best way I can. Ulrich Patillo Jr. played baseball and chess and decided not to become a dentist. After high school, I uh, went to work for my father in his medical technology business uh, while also attending school. Uh, then I uh, was employed with the Los Angeles Police Department as a police dispatcher. Uh, I retired after 37 and a half years of dedicated service to the public. I retired in 2019, March of 2019. My wife and I, we produced five talented, wonderful children, three boys and two girls. No grandchildren yet, but I'm looking forward to it. I also uh, was a volunteer uh, baseball and golf coach at my kids' school. I thoroughly enjoyed that. And now my plan and Retirement is to enjoy my kids and play as much golf as I possibly can. Bob Piste already had a passion for sailing and after UC Santa Barbara made it his livelihood. I went to work for a sailmaker down in Seal Beach uh, called North Sails. Uh, apprenticed through that, through the whole gamut of sailing, sailmaking, uh, have been racing sailboats my entire adult life all over the planet. It's been fun. It's been very good. Semi-profitable knowing lots of rich people. I got married in 82, moved to uh, Seattle in 83, uh, opened the business up here and uh, sailed and, and uh, things have been good. We had two sons, have a two and a half year old granddaughter. Yeah. Now just sold the business six years ago and happily retired. Mike Russell had a simple goal, to be able to do and have what I want. I coached football, varsity football at Newberry Park High School and later on at Simi Valley High School. Did two live performances in Marina Del Rey in front of uh, 500 people each. And it was the most exhilarating, freeing uh, time of my life. It was amazing. And um, that next Monday, I uh, enrolled in acting school. And that was about three years ago. Uh, and then because of the pandemic, I had retired. Um, and so I was acting full time, nothing major, getting into little things here and there, background, did some, uh, starred in some student films, did some network TV, nothing, nothing major. Um, I wish I had started it 50 years ago, but anyway, it, it, it's an amazing experience. I love it. Um, keeps me busy. 
One quick thing, I do have four children. I have 12 grandchildren with one more on the way, probably end up with about 15 or so. Um, I'm living up in Spokane, Washington. I commute to LA back and forth. Um, I have a daughter who lives in Phoenix, Arizona. I have a son, my youngest son still lives in Los Angeles and works for Puritan Bakery. Um, and my two older sons, Noah and Dylan, both live up here in uh, Spokane. So uh, I am blessed beyond words uh, at the life I've had. And I can't wait to get together with, with you guys and, and hear what you've all been up to. Fleet-footed Michael Stevenson left Murphy with ambition unknown, but soon found plenty to keep him busy. School was not my thing, so I started working full-time for L.A. Unified School District, ran as high as being the youngest plant manager ever in LAUSD. I then went on to use aircraft, became an experimental uh, electroplater, dealing with precious metals for 23 years. After that, I went on, when Boeing bought us, I went to Boeing and became a ceramics technician for 12 years. I went on and I worked at General Dynamics over in Torrance, and there I was experimental nickel plater, at which time I got laid off there, and I went out to the VA. I worked out there for a year, then I got tired of work altogether, and I retired. I'm now living a nice retired life. Greetings, class of 1972. This is Jim McGarry, class of 1970. Um, congratulations on pulling off a reunion. Uh, I'm here to talk about my old friend, Marty Welsh, your classmate. Uh, I was his neighbor, grew up with him, played a thousand games of ping pong and another thousand of basketball in the backyard. We uh, had a garage band playing all the, the day's greatest hits. And I'm sure you remember him as a great student, uh, a, a good solid basketball player and, and, and a good friend to, to many of you. He did not go gently into that good night. Uh, he also put out a book of some of the hilarious things, believe it or not, that happened to him in those last five, six years of his life. It's called Laugh to Death. He also raised hundreds of thousands of dollars through the Sacramento chapter uh, of ALS uh, walks. And a number of us were on his team called Marty's Martyrs. He wanted everyone who suffers from this mysterious disease. We don't know the origin of the cure, but he wanted people to be able to have all the, the beautiful technology and assistance uh, that he was able to have. And so that's why he raised that money. So someone to really be proud of from the class of 72. Lift a glass to Marty Welsh. Father Vincent Lopez, principal our last three years, now 92, here celebrating Mass one recent Sunday at St. Victor's Church in West Hollywood. You know the best gifts that Almighty God has given us, your, your classmates, your, your fellow students, they're just wonderful young men with, with, with great hearts and great ambition 
to do something with their lives. And I was so proud of those, those students at that time. Noblemen. I like the way that sounds. Noblemen. The motto of the Murphy Nobles comes straight from Scripture. Isaiah chapter 32, verse 8. A noble man does noble deeds, and by noble deeds he stands. Quoted in a letter of congratulations from the Western Province of Dominican Friars, wrote the very Reverend Christopher Fadick, O.P., I pray that as you remember the halcyon days of your youth, you also reflect on how you fulfilled the Daniel Murphy Pledge. Did you do your best to live up to the ideals of Daniel Murphy Catholic High School? Did you become a truly noble man? The letter does not go into the later accusations against four clergy faculty members, but does include a prayer request for the friars who served at Daniel Murphy, many of whom have gone to God. You take the good with the bad, and you just make it and make it positive, and you move forward with it. I was just uh, growing up an insecure kid, just like everybody else, um, trying to make my way. One thing I liked most about Murphy was the social things that, that were going on, the, the dances and all that, and the education that did help me in, in later life. So we could be literally across the yard in high school, and someone would yell out, Hey, black man, say it loud. And someone would go, I'm black and I'm proud. You know, it's that kind of, of, of rallying cry that was there. If you want a great education, you go to the Jesuits. If you want to know how to think, you go to the Dominicans. When I drive by the former Daniel Murphy High School, I'm struck by how unassuming it is. And yet I learned much, including values there, and met wonderful teachers and fellow students. My best Murphy memory was all the relationships that I established. And I still maintain some of those relationships to this day. I enjoyed the camaraderie, the laughing, the joking, the teasing, the merciless teasing that went on. It helped me develop a thick skin. And I pass that on to my children, having a thick skin. Every place where you go and do something, you need a foundation and you need to have um, an example of creating a certain work ethic and not being afraid to achieve and move forward. And you, I think I found that at Murphy, not only with the teachers, but with the students. The students were great people. So I haven't seen these guys in 50 years, but there's a connection. And I'm, I'm enjoying and loving it. So. I learned how to tie a tie on my bicycle, riding into, uh, <laughs> riding into class with, uh, with no, uh, you know, no hands on the handlebar. We were put at Daniel Murphy for a reason. Um, and I think the reason has come full circle with us coming together now. Your actions speak louder than words. And noble man does noble deeds. Well, thank you. Huh? That's, that's poetic. <laughs> Hail to thee, our alma mater. Hey, you know the thing. A 50-year tradition continues. I'm Patrick Healy, class of 1972. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>